We have had a great feast of scripture this morning, haven't we? And uh, listening to what Jesus did and who he was and what he did, uh, and, and uh, how he related to various people. And uh, I love these two chapters uh, because they tell us so much about Jesus, but also because they tell us that Jesus was a sailor, or at least he hung around with sailors. And uh, I like sailing. And uh, once Janet and I, not long after we moved to Melbourne, actually, we didn't know Port Phillip Bay very well. Uh, we went out sailing on Port Phillip Bay and it was a really, really hot day. And uh, so we went out and we threw the anchor over and had a swim and then we pulled the anchor up and did a bit more sailing and we were out there for quite a few hours. And then uh, later we noticed this white line coming down the bay from the south. And I thought, that looks interesting. I wonder what that is. And uh, we also noticed that there weren't many boats around. They tend to be, seemed to be heading for the shore. And then the temperature started to drop. From It had been about 45 degrees and it was dropping down to about 40. And it kept dropping. And suddenly I woke up. This is a storm front coming through from the south. And the, the um, wind was chopping up the waves and that was the white line that was coming down the bay. And the storm front, of course, is really strong at the beginning of it. And uh, we didn't wake up quick enough. We were learning a lot about Port Phillip Bay in a hurry. And uh, this storm front hit and we didn't get the sails down quickly enough. And within about a minute and a half, one of our sails was totally shredded by the wind. And uh, when I read this passage, I think, okay, Jesus is very, very different from me. (laughs) And, And from any of us. Now try it next time you're down the bay and it's blowing a gale from the west or the south and stand up and say, stop, and see what happens. <laughs> Probably nothing. <laughs> but when Jesus did it, it stopped. He rebuked the wind and the waves and they went quiet. It went dead calm. Today we're looking at Jesus, the man you can't ignore. We're answering our question Who is Jesus? And in these two chapters we see uh, not only in what he did and who he is, but also in the responses that people made to him. You just can't ignore him. You have to respond to him. So three reasons why you can't ignore him. Firstly, because he's the ruler of creation. This long passage is bookended by two accounts of disciples in a boat in a storm. Okay, the first one, uh, Jesus has told his disciples to, he said, let's go, we'll go over to the other side of the lake. Now, a couple of reasons for that. One was Jesus was totally exhausted. He wanted to get away from the crowd that he had just been preaching to. The other reason was that we know from chapter 3 that the Pharisees are dead set against Jesus and they've gone and because they can't put him to death, they've gone and talked to Herod or the Herodians, Herod's mob, the Roman rulers, to plot how to kill Jesus. So from then on in Mark's gospel, you've got this sort of cat and mouse thing going on. Jesus ducks outside Herod's territory quite frequently because he's on a mission to preach the kingdom and that mission is not yet completed. There's still more places he wants to go and preach this kingdom, tell people who he is and what God's going to do. So... they take off to the other side of the lake, which is outside Herod's territory. Jesus goes into the back of the boat and lies down and goes to sleep. And they take off. And they haven't gone very far when those fishermen's most feared natural disaster comes upon them. And that's a storm on that lake. They're very common, actually. Uh, In the the evening when the... the, uh, the cool air comes in from the Mediterranean and mixes with the warm air over the lake. These storms just come up really, really quickly. And one of them came up and it was, it was a really, really strong one. By the way, it appears like Jesus doesn't have a care in the world. He's lying asleep in the back of the boat. He was probably utterly exhausted. And uh, I think there's more than a hint here that it actually is okay to take a rest. The Son of God did it even though there's a disaster brewing around him. And he actually left the running of the boat and the trimming of the sails and dealing with the storm 
uh, in the hands of his disciples, uh, who were good at that. They'd been out there before. But of course, this is a big one. And Luke tells us they were in great danger. The waves are breaking over the side of the boat. And uh, Jesus sleeps on, even though it's crashing through the waves. And Jesus sleeps in the back. And of course, then the disciples, they sound a little bit annoyed, don't they? They go to him and say, Teacher, don't you care if we perish? Don't you care if we drown? Jesus gets up, stands up and rebukes the winds, wind and the waves. And immediately, Mark tells us, it was completely calm. Not less stormy or a little bit less windy. Totally calm. I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, Crocodile Dundee. Uh, if you have, you remember that bit where Dundee and his uh, American journalist, his, forget what she came to do, but anyway, they come across this bit where they're out in the bush and this wild buffalo with huge horns comes charging down the track at them. And of course, the American journalist is terrified. And Dundee just stands there and he goes like this and stares down this huge buffalo and it just goes to sleep and collapses on the ground. That's a little bit like, like what Jesus did on that boat to that storm. There's a huge difference though. Crocodile Dundee is fiction. <laughs> what Jesus did is reality. These eyewitnesses are recording it here. They are stunned and they are terrified, it says. They're terrified. They say, who is this? It seems like they're more terrified than they were before. So who is this that can stand up and, and tell the wind and the waves to stop and to shut up? And they do. Well, the answer to the question actually comes in the second episode, which is at the other end of our passage. And uh, this time Jesus is not in the boat. It's three o'clock in the morning and his disciples are rowing against the wind again to the other side of the lake. And Jesus is up on a mountainside praying. And he sees what's going on. He sees them really struggling. It's three o'clock in the morning. And so Jesus sees that they're in, they're in deep trouble. So he walks to them on the lake, walking on the water. Now they see, him, see this figure walking on water and on the lake and they're terrified again. And they think it's a ghost. And Jesus calls out, don't be afraid, don't fear. It is I. Or literally, I, I am. The same as in the I am sayings of Jesus in John's Gospel. So what's the answer to their question? Who is this person that the winds and the waves obey him? The answer, of course, is he's God. Because what Jesus is saying when he uses those words, when he says, I am, he's using words that come right straight out of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3, where Moses, when God told him to go and tell Pharaoh to let the people, his people go, uh, Moses is terrified as he's there at that burning bush. He doesn't want to go and talk to the most powerful man in the world at the time and tell him to let go of all his slaves. So Moses says, who should I say is sending me? I can't do that myself. And so God says, tell him that I am sent you. Exactly the same words that Jesus used. In other words, the self-existent, all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty being, God himself sends you. So the answer to the disciples' question, who is this? Jesus says, don't worry, I am. He's saying, I'm God. He's claiming that he himself is the ruler and creator of the whole universe. And that's why he can stand up and order the wind and the waves about, stop storms, do anything. The Apostle Paul in uh, Colossians 1 uh, develops this a bit more. He says, speaking of Jesus, <clears throat> He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things and in him all things hold together. This 
is the person who stands up in that boat and rebukes the winds and the waves. Friends, this is why we can't ignore him. Why you and I cannot ignore him. He is the ruler and creator of the whole universe, which of course he means, it means that he's my ruler and my creator, your ruler and your creator. You cannot ignore him. Secondly, the second reason why we can't ignore him is in chapter 5. Because he conquers evil, suffering and death. The most feared spiritual disaster that could befall someone at that time was to be oppressed by demons. And Jesus meets this man who is oppressed by many demons uh, as he reaches the other side of the lake. I don't know if you've ever experienced somebody who is demon-possessed or demon-oppressed. It really is a terrible bondage. When we were living uh, in our village in Pakistan, uh, some people we knew brought a relative of theirs to us to be prayed for. A young girl who, this is really weird stuff, every time the call to prayer came from the mosque, she would start screaming and start speaking in the voice of a dead Muslim man, even though she, she herself was a Hindu. And that had ruined her life. She couldn't do much. Five times a day, 365 days of the year, she was going through this yelling and screaming, and at other times as well. She couldn't get married. Her whole life was wrecked by this bondage. Now this case that Jesus came across on the other side of the lake is actually much worse than this, the one that we experienced. This man had stacks of demons in him. In fact, they call themselves legion. A Roman legion was a military unit uh, that had 6,000 soldiers in it. Okay, so they're saying, (laughs) there's quite a few of us, Jesus. And this guy was so violent uh, that no one could hold him down. And when they tried to restrain him with chains, he just snapped them. Uh, He was like the the Hulk on steroids. Nobody could subdue him. And he'd been relegated to live in the cemetery. And there he screamed out and shrieked out day and night and cut himself. He couldn't live near anybody else. Can you think of a worse picture of satanic bondage than that? And Jesus, when Jesus comes, this guy who nobody can subdue, he comes and falls at the feet of Jesus, meekly. And then one of the demons in him calls out, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? It's interesting, isn't it? This guy, a demon-possessed person earlier than this has addressed Jesus in the same way. And this guy does as well, even before the disciples fully understand who Jesus is. He calls Jesus the son of the most high God. Uh, That tells us something, doesn't it? Uh, That you can know lots and lots of stuff about God and about Jesus and still be on the wrong side. It's about entrusting ourselves to him, isn't it? And Jesus reaches out and tells these demons to get out of this guy. As they answer back, they say, don't send us out of the region. And they're scared. And, and, and by the way, you notice here that, that, that they know that whatever Jesus says, they have to do it. There are no options. They, don't, they, they have to do whatever Jesus says. So they beg him. So please don't send us out of this region, out of this country. There's some pigs nearby and they beg to go into the pigs. And Jesus says, okay. And they go into the pigs and, you know, the pigs rush down into the lake and they drown. That tells us something about Satan, doesn't it? The Apostle John, or Jesus in, in, the, uh, Apostle, uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John, says that the work of Satan is to deceive and to destroy He's a liar and a murderer. And he destroys those 2,000 pigs. That's his purpose, to deceive and to destroy. 
The owners of the pigs realise that uh, this is bad news for them and for the region. Uh, it's business is not. There's going to be a big plunge in their shares on the stock market the next day, and so they they beg Jesus to go, get out of our region. That's sad, isn't it? Really, when you think of it, here's this guy that they've known who's been in this bondage all his life, screaming out day and night and cutting himself, self harming all the time. And he's been released. He's sitting there dressed and in his right mind, Mark tells us. And these guys say, Jesus, please go. Did it not occur to them that there might be other people around that could really be helped by this guy? That there were other people who are under bondage to Satan and sin and evil that Jesus could have released? But to them, their prophet's more important than those people. And they beg him to go. It's interesting, isn't it? The two responses in verses 17 and 18, everyone's begging. (laughs) The people in the area beg them to go out, Jesus to go. But the man who's been changed, been released from this bondage, he begs to go with Jesus. He wants to be with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you stay here and you tell. Go and tell how much the Lord has done for you. Jesus is the man you can't ignore because he's supreme over Satan. One of my favourite verses in the New Testament is 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Friends, if you're a Christian and Christ is in your life, Jesus is greater than Satan. Him and his cohorts cannot harm you because Jesus rules and whatever he says, they have to do it. It's wonderful truth, isn't it? I can't say the same thing if you don't have Christ in your life, if if you're not trusting in Jesus. I think Satan's more powerful than us. That's what this passage tells us. But he's not more powerful than Jesus. Jesus is way more powerful. That's why we can't ignore him. Secondly, he's powerful over sickness. Sickness, of course, is one of the things that dogs the human race. We're all going to die of some disease or other. And the older you get, the more common a topic of conversation it is. Talk to some of the older people in our congregation. How are you going? What sort of week did you have? Oh, I went to the physio on Monday. I went to the, the, uh, the um, cancer specialist on Tuesday and I, went, I had my eyes tested on Thursday. Pretty much the whole life is taken up with dealing with a body that is going downhill. Uh, one of the fears of the human race, isn't it, of all of us, is we're going to get some debilitating sickness. And everyone talks about the cancer as the C word, don't they? And sickness is a terrible thing, isn't it? It does so much damage. It's very important for, to us to deal with it, isn't it? Nationally, we spend, spend uh, 17% of our budget next year on health, looking after people who are sick, researching illness, and rightly so. We want to relieve suffering, $70 billion. This person that comes to Jesus... She has, been, she has been sick for 12 years. She's had a 12-year-long period. She's had a 12-year blood flow and it's affected her life in every way. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? She, it would have affected her physically within her own body. It would have, would have affected, if she, were, if she was married, it, it would have affected her sexually. If she wasn't married, it would have affected her chances of getting married. It affected her spiritually. She's unclean from a Jewish point of view. It affected her financially. She'd been to heaps and heaps of doctors that all charged her heaps and heaps of money and not made a shred of difference and she's got worse. And she puts her hope in Jesus and she gets in with the crowd. The crowd's going along. They're going to Jairus' place because Jairus' daughter's very unwell. And she thinks, "If, if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, then I'll be made well. Jesus in this crowd, people are pressing around. It's probably a bit like getting on a train in China when Chinese New Year's about to happen. You know, you, 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 you don't walk, you just hang onto your bags and you get carried into the train. And <clears throat> this is what's happening with Jesus. And, and Jesus somehow knows that she's touched her. In fact, he says he knows that the power's gone out of him and says to his disciples, Who touched me? They're saying, Come on, Jesus. How many hundred people have touched you? Jesus knows and 
He really cares for this woman. Even though she's already healed, the blood flow stopped. Jesus really cares for her because he wants her not to hang on to her superstitions that somehow his magic clothing healed him, healed her. But he tells her, no, it's your faith that has healed you. It's your faith in Jesus, not some superstitious thing. It's interesting, the word that Mark uses for heal here is also the word for to save. It's the same word that uh, was used when Jesus was on the cross, when the, uh, the, one of the thieves on the cross said, save yourself and save us. Now it's not just about physical healing. Uh, what's also at work is, here is, the, is, the, is the broader issue of people who have been, who, whose lives have been ruined by the ravages of sin and that Jesus has come to change all that to rescue us from that and that's why you can't ignore him because he's come to fix that stuff such as his power thirdly we've got the uh, jesus supremacy over death there's the other reason why you can't ignore him revelation the book of revelation describes death as the last enemy and certainly is isn't it the one thing that's common to human experience after birth Uh, They say that death and taxes are the two certainties of life. That's not quite true, actually. I think there are some people who've managed to get through life without paying any tax. I hear that they're very rich. Um, (laughs) But everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies. That's the great reality. And, of course, the, the thing that people fear. And Jesus is on the way... Uh, Jairus the synagogue leader has said to Jesus come my daughter's very unwell she's got a 12 year old daughter on the way as, in, uh, as Jesus stops to talk to the, the woman with the blood flow and, and she's been healed people come and say look don't bother him anymore your daughter's died they tell Jesus don't they tell him not to bother Jesus anymore but Jesus hears that and he says says to Jairus don't fear, only believe. Again, this idea comes up in these passages. Don't fear, believe. The reason for not fearing is because you believe. And he tell, he's, he's telling Jairus, trust me, believe in me. They get there and the professional mourners are already on the job. And Jesus says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And they laugh. These guys have been at funerals before. They know a dead body when they see one. And they laugh at Jesus. And Jesus tells them to get out. And he goes in with three of his disciples and the parents. And he says to this little girl, Talitha Komi, which means little lamb in Aramaic. And he takes her and raises her up and she walks out. This is the first incidence in Mark's gospel of Jesus raising someone from the dead, resuscitating them, basically. It's not a full resurrection, is it? Has anyone seen Jairus' daughter lately? No, she went on to die. Uh, But this points us to Jesus' mighty power over death. He's conquered it and he's going to conquer it completely through his death on the cross. He's the conqueror of death. That's why we cannot ignore him. And he conquers death uh, because of us, for us. We'll get more of that later. So he's Lord over Satan and his cohorts. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over death itself. You cannot ignore him. Finally, in the chapter 6, we cannot ignore him because he's the compassionate shepherd. Uh, in this chapter, there are two feasts. There's Herod's wild party in verses 14 to 29. And there's Jesus' feeding of a crowd of more than 10,000 people. These two feasts look very different. In one feast, it's a bunch of elites who are in Herod's palace celebrating his birthday. There's all sorts of intrigue going on. There's broken promises. There's that gruesome scene in the end where this guy who had challenged Herod about his sinful relationships he's he's executed in the jail john the baptist and his head is brought in on a on a platter and herod is racked with guilt 
and shame. But he's got no option. He's a weak leader. And he, and he, and he succumbs to the machinations of, of his wife and the crowd. It's an awful scene. And on the other hand, you've got the other feast out, on the, on the, out in the open where more than 10,000 people are gathered listening to Jesus. Uh, the context here is that Jesus actually had, had gone to take a break again on the other side of the lake and the people had all followed, rushed around the other side of the lake so that when he got there, they were there waiting, thousands of them. And uh, Mark tells us that Jesus saw them and he had compassion on them, even though he's exhausted. He felt a love and a compassion for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he's the good shepherd, the one that lays down his life for the sheep. And so Jesus teaches them. And uh, they're listening patiently, hanging on his every word, so much so that they don't notice that, that the day is starting to end. And they've come from a distance. And of course, the hunger is starting to set in and, and the disciples start to get worried, like... This huge crowds there and there are no catering, catering arrangements and, and this is sort of their event. And uh, so they come to Jesus and say, you know, time to uh, finish up and pronounce the benediction and uh, send these people home so they can, they can go, go into the towns and find themselves some food. And Jesus said, why don't you feed them? Somebody does a quick calculation and uh, works out it's about 50,000 bucks worth to feed this crowd and uh, of course they don't happen to have that on them and Jesus said okay what have we got and they're five loaves and a couple of fish and Jesus said get everyone to sit down he prayed he broke the bread and those fish and distributed it everybody ate till they were satisfied and there was left over this compassionate shepherd has provided the spiritual food for those people in teaching them the gospel, the, the good news and that they need to repent. And he's also provided for their physical food. Of course, those two things are connected. They're connected to the same person who is a gracious, generous provider. Of course, it points us forward, doesn't it, to that great feast when we will sit down with Jesus all together and enjoy that great wedding feast of, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the bride and uh, we'll be the bride of Christ and we'll, there'll be that great feast when we're finally united with him and this all happens because this compassionate shepherd loves us so much that he gives up his own life on the cross so that we can be forgiven so that we can know his grace and mercy we can know his unconditional love in spite of the fact that we are sinners that we fail him. You can't ignore a person like that, can you? That is so loving, so gracious. Imagine if I came to you with a really, really expensive gift. That Lamborghini we were talking about last week. Imagine, Michael, if I came to you and said, Michael, I'm really impressed with you as a person. I, I love you very much. Please have this Lamborghini. Now, how, yeah, he's going like this. <laughs> you can't ignore that, can you? You can't just stand there and say nothing or just walk away. You have to respond somehow, don't you? To such generous love, unconditional giving. What Jesus has done for us on the cross is way, 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 way more generous than that. Him, the Lord, the ruler, the creator of the universe has come to this earth and given up his own life so that we might forgive, be forgiven. This compassionate, loving, gracious shepherd. That's why we can't ignore him because he loves us so much. So we can't ignore him because he's the ruler, owner, controller of the whole universe. He's a ruler over evil and, and sickness and death. And he's the compassionate shepherd. How do we respond to this? 
two things. Firstly, trust. Over and over again, Jesus says in this, these couple of chapters, don't be afraid, believe, trust. Faith is at the forefront of these encounters. Of the demoniac being released, of the woman, of Jairus and his daughter. They all trust in Jesus. They want to be with him. Of course, there are counterexamples. There are others who clearly don't want to trust in him. The pig owners, their love of riches gets in the way. They want to hang on to what they've got. And they know that having this person in their territory doing this kind of stuff, their lives cannot be the same again. They have to respond to him. And if they're going to respond like the man who was transformed, it's going to turn their lives upside down. They say, no, we don't want it. There's another bunch of people that we read about at the beginning of chapter 6 in Jesus' hometown. He goes there and preaches in the synagogue. And they hear his wise words and stuff like that. And they say, where did he get this stuff from? He's, this, is, this is just a carpenter. We know his brothers and sisters. And they, they were offended at him. What's that about? It's familiarity, isn't it? Friends, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge myself as well. Some of you have been coming to this church for many, many years. Some of you have grown up in Sunday school, youth group, life group. Have we become so familiar with Jesus that it really doesn't change our lives? The report of Mark about what happened in Nazareth was that Jesus could do no mighty works there. It wasn't that he was powerless. He did do some mighty works there. But he said it was amazed at their lack of faith. They knew so much about Jesus, but it might not made a bit of difference to their lives. Now, friends, if Jesus came here this morning, and how would he respond? Would he, would he be amazed at how much our lives have changed, how much we trust him? How much our lives are different because of what he's done for us? Or would he be amazed that we know so much about him and it makes so little difference in our lives? It's a big challenge, isn't it? That's the challenge, that to trust Jesus, no matter what, whether it ruins your business, your career, whatever. To hand your life over totally to Jesus. That's what matters. Secondly, to tell. Uh, you notice that the, um, the guy at the beginning of the passage that, that's uh, released from the bondage of the demon oppression, he, Jesus says, no, don't come with me. You go and tell all the people in the Decapolis. Decapolis was a big area. There's a map coming up there. It's about the size of Greater Melbourne. And that guy went and told people how much the Lord had done for him. We can all do that, can't we? If you believe God's done something for you, that Jesus has changed your life, we can go and tell people about it. Jesus sends out the 12 to go two by two, gave them the authority over unclean spirits and they went, they took the message to more than 200 towns and he gave them instructions, travel light. And uh, they went and they preached and they cast out demons and they healed the sick. Jesus also told me they didn't receive their message to shake off the dust of their, their feet. Uh, which was a warning to them. Guys, you don't receive the message of Jesus. You're not, you're not part of the people of God. Even though they were Jews and said, yeah, we're, we are, they were to be given that warning that, listen, if you don't obey the gospel, here are the consequences. That's part of telling others about Christ, warning them about the danger that they're in. So trust and tell. These are the things I think we learn from these two great chapters. It's not rocket science, is it? It's probably the same thing we're saying a lot of weeks. But I need to hear it again and again, and we all do, so that we might give Jesus the place that he deserves in our lives as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Friends, let's bow in prayer uh, together and ask for his help. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your mighty power that you are the ruler and creator of the whole universe it was all made through you and for you and lord we know that that includes us and uh, lord we want to come and say we're sorry that there's so many things in our lives where that's not reflected 
Uh, so often we're at the center of things rather than you. So Lord, we pray that you would so work in our lives that our trust in you might not be something we just talk about, but something that really changes our lives day by day. It'll change what we do tomorrow as we interact with work colleagues or friends or, or family. Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us not to fear whatever we're facing this week or even today, that we would believe, that we would trust you as the Lord of the universe. And Lord, pray that as we do that, that uh, you might empower and strengthen us, that we might go out with your authority to tell people all that you have done for us through your death on the cross, that they too might hear this great message and be saved from their sin and put their trust in you. And we pray this for your glory. Amen.